Young Earth creationists believe that the global flood in the Noah's Ark story, as described in the Bible, actually took place. The timeline of this account is summarized by Phil Center as follows, quote, The account describes a flooding event in which water rose for 40 days and receded for the rest of a single year, during which the planet was completely submerged for 150 days, end quote. In this video, we're going to examine and debunk the geological evidence that creationists provide to support this belief. One common argument you'll hear is that the existence of the same or very similar rock layers in multiple different locations around the world is proof of a global flood. Here's how Andrew Snelling puts it in a lecture for Answers in Genesis. And wouldn't you and I expect to find widespread rapidly deposited rock layers because the flood was a global and it went all around the, 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 the earth? Yes! we find rock layers that can be traced all the way across continents and even between continents. In an article of his, he cites the Grand Canyon's Tapiat sandstone layer as one that's found in multiple locations around the world. Specifically, he notes that it's found in Arizona, Wisconsin, Libya, and Israel. His conclusion is that, quote, the only mechanism that could spread such thick layers of sand over many continents is the Genesis flood, ends quote. That's obviously not true right there. Finding similar rock layers during the same time period in multiple locations around the world is only proof that at this time period, similar events and changes were taking place on the planet, but any number of different mechanisms could account for this. Maybe oscillating sea levels at the time led to sedimentary deposition in many different spots around the world, or maybe the organization of the continents and ocean currents at the time led to widespread formation of deserts and sand dunes on the planet. Jumping to the extraordinary, supernatural explanation when much simpler ones exist just doesn't make any logical sense. I should also point out that 550 million years ago, when the Tapiat sandstone was deposited, the continents were organized much differently from how they are today. 550 million years ago, North America was this blue blob right here. I don't know where exactly Arizona versus Wisconsin would be on this blob, but the basic takeaway is that what today look like reasonably far away locations, back then could have been much closer together. So it's not even necessarily a global event that created these sandstone layers. Same goes for his other two-sided locations, Libya and Israel. 550 million years ago, what today is Africa and the Arabian Peninsula were smashed right up against one another. And while I don't know what portion of these blobs would best correspond to modern-day North Africa or Israel, again, perhaps even localized events could explain what we see here. And just because certain observations are compatible with an explanation doesn't automatically mean that that explanation is the correct one. Technically, such rock layers could have been deposited by a divine global flood. So you could look at this and say, aha, that means the evidence is compatible with my religious beliefs. That is not the same thing as saying that the observations are evidence for your religious beliefs, especially when there are other, simpler explanations that don't require any godly miracles. And the final glaring drawback to this argument is the fact that Snelling's timeline is off by about 550 million years. According to him, the Great Flood took place in 2348 BC, while these sandstone deposits were laid down in 550 million BC. So you're a little off there on the numbers, but how could the flood described in the Bible be the source of this much older sandstone? Did Noah also construct a giant time machine? The Tapiat sandstone corresponds to the early Cambrian period, which is way down here on the geological column. According to the biblical timeline, the Great Flood took place 4,400 years ago, which corresponds to only the very tiniest top sliver of the Quaternary period. So if you were looking for geological evidence of the flood, you'd have to restrict yourself to this paper-thin section up here. Directing us towards the early Cambrian makes about as much sense as searching for life on Mars by pointing your telescope scope at the moon. Snelling makes the same argument about the chalk beds of England, quote, The chalk beds of England, the White Cliffs of Dover, can be traced across Europe into the Middle East and are also found in the Midwest of the United States and in Western Australia, end quote. This, I think, is even more ridiculous than pointing to the Tapiat sandstone, because in this case, the White Cliffs were largely formed from the calcium carbonate shells of coccolithophores, a single-celled algae that would have lived near the ocean surface at the time. In some locations, these deposits are up to five 
500 meters thick. How could it possibly be the case that at the time of the biblical flood, so much algae existed that their death in the flood would lead to the formation of a 500 meter thick layer on the ocean floor in several different locations all across the world? And this is 500 meters thick after being compacted downwards with no space between the dead organisms. While alive, there would obviously have to be much more space between them, because if they were that compacted at the ocean surface where they photosynthesize, there simply wouldn't be any sunlight that could penetrate the thick layer to supply them. Here's the problem. In the ocean past a depth of 200 meters, there's not enough sunlight to support photosynthesizing organisms. So it's not like they could be more comfortably spaced out all the way down to the ocean bottom or something. That means in order to even have the potential to photosynthesize, all of these coccolithophores would have to be packed into the first 200 meters of the ocean surface. But for that to work, they'd have to be so densely packed together that no sunlight could penetrate the surface, meaning they couldn't be packed this densely because they couldn't survive survive this way. And even if, through some miracle of biology, they somehow could photosynthesize when so densely packed together, they would literally just form a 200 meter thick block at the ocean surface. If that was the case, how would the rest of ocean life survive? And how could Noah even set sea in his ark with such a pesky, chalky barrier in his way? Did he first have to chip away at it with a pickaxe or something? Without realizing it, what creationists are presenting here is a literal physical impossibility. There is no conceivable way that that many coccolithophores could have possibly existed in the ocean waters at the time of the Great Flood. The only explanation that matches up with the observations and with basic common sense is the gradualistic one, that these layers were slowly deposited over time as multiple generations of coccolithophores lived, died, and sunk to the bottom over hundreds and thousands of years. The very evidence creationists cite as proof of their position is actually a knockdown argument against their position. The last thing I would ask about this is why would we see such a narrow spectrum of specific organisms being deposited in these chalk layers? On the flood model, wouldn't we expect a big jumbled mix-up of all kinds of organisms in these layers? The fact that these chalk layers are comprised of one particular type of organism better supports the gradualistic evolutionary model where during this time period, that particular type of algae was abundant in the oceans. Something else you'll see creationists do is try to discredit the early pioneers of geology by framing them as unqualified amateurs who didn't know what they were talking about, and they contrast them against the supremely qualified experts who supported the Noah's Ark catastrophism viewpoint. Henry Morris of the Institute for Creation Research, for example, writes the following, quote, In the early days of geology, especially during the 17th and 18th centuries, the dominant explanation for the sedimentary rocks and their fossilized contents was that they had been laid down in the great flood of the days of Noah. This was the view of Steno, the father of stratigraphy, whose principles of stratigraphic interpretation are still followed today, and of John Woodward, Sir Isaac Newton's hand-picked successor at Cambridge, whose studies on sedimentary processes laid the foundation for modern sedimentology and geomorphology. These men and the other flood geologists of their day were careful scientists, thoroughly acquainted with the sedimentary rocks and the geophysical processes which formed them. In common with most other scientists of their day, they believed in God and the divine authority of the Bible." End quote. Notice the endless adulation that he heaps upon the early scientists who agree with him. Isaac Newton's hand-picked successor laid the foundation for modern sedimentology. Careful scientists thoroughly acquainted with the sedimentary rocks. If he was blowing these guys any harder, there'd be a Westboro Baptist protest about it. Contrast his veneration of these noble Genesis-believing scientists with his characterization of the gradualistic scientists at the time, quote, It is significant that this uniformitarian revolution was led not by professional scientific geologists, but by amateurs, men such as Buckland, a theologian, Cuvier, an anatomist, Buffon, a lawyer, Hutton, an agriculturalist, Smith, a surveyor, Chambers, a journalist, Lyle, a lawyer, and others of similar variegated backgrounds, end quote. Yeah, you know, scientists like James Hutton and Charles Lyell, who laid the foundations of modern geology, really just a couple of bums when it comes right down to it. James Hutton, a measly agriculturalist, yeah, how about you stick to farming, buddy? Why don't you step aside and leave the science to we serious people who believe that a 600-year-old man literally collected two of every animal in a giant boat? 
Look, back around that time period, scientific fields simply weren't as developed and separated as they are today. It was much more common back then for people making contributions to a field to also work in other areas as well. Thomas Jefferson, for example, in addition to his political contributions, also worked as a lawyer, architect, naturalist, paleontologist, inventor, agronomist, and linguist. He even drove for Uber on the weekends. Despite wearing these many different hats, Jefferson played a central role in discovering the giant ground sloth of North America. Pointing out his lack of specialized expertise in that field doesn't nullify his contributions to it. This dabbling in many different fields wasn't unusual back then. Part of that's because these were much newer fields with many more discoveries to be made, and I also think part of it's just because there wasn't a lot to do back then. They didn't have Netflix or Twitter or Reddit to entertain them, so they'd get bored and just be like, fuck, I guess I'll go explore this mountain or something. At the end of the day, a person's credentials have no bearing on whether the claim they're making is true or not. Whether it's a farmer or an anatomist or an agriculturalist who's making claims about geology, the core question question isn't what are their credentials, it's are these claims supported by evidence? In the case of gradualistic geology, the answer is yes. It's also kind of weird to critique people who were basically the founders of a certain field as not being experts in that field, but I'll leave it to creationists to sort that out. Morris finishes strong by jumping completely off the deep end, quote, This capitulation of the scientist to evolution was an enormous boon to the social revolutionaries, who could now proclaim widely that their theories of social change were grounded in natural science. For example, Karl Marx and the communists quickly aligned themselves with evolutionary geology and biology, end quote. Yes, it starts out with believing that Earth is very old, and before you know it, you're a filthy communist. Another piece of geological evidence they'll point to are weird formations where rock layers are bent and deformed in strange ways. Here's what Andrew Snelling writes for Answers in Genesis, quote, Evidence number six, many strata lay down in rapid succession. Rocks do not normally bend, they break because they are hard and brittle. But in many places, we find whole sequences of strata that were bent without fracturing, indicating that all the rock layers were rapidly deposited and folded, while still wet and pliable before final hardening. For example, the Tapiat sandstone in Grand Canyon is folded at a right angle, 90 degrees, without evidence of breaking. Yet this folding could only have occurred after the rest of the layers had been deposited, supposedly over 480 million years, while the Tapiat sandstone remained wet and pliable." End quote. Look, deformed rock layers like this, while definitely interesting, are well understood by geologists. Metamorphic rock, for example, like this one here where the layers are all wavy and contorted, are simply produced by heat heat and pressure generated in the Earth's crust. You can also go to any geology website and read in painstaking, excruciating detail about the many different types of geological folds and what specific mechanisms lead to their formation. To take just one example, geologypage.com writes that, quote, chevron folds are a structural feature characterized by repeated, well-behaved folded beds with straight limbs and sharp hinges. Well-developed, these folds develop repeated sets of V-shaped beds. They develop in response to regional or local compressive stress. Chevron folding preferentially occurs when the bedding regularly alternates between contrasting competences. Turbidites, characterized by alternating high-competent sandstones and low-competent shales, provide the typical geological setting for chevron folds to occur." End quote. Very exciting stuff, I know. So, this idea that merely observing folded rock in and of itself is proof of the biblical flood is simply not true. And Andrew Snelling has a PhD in geology, he should really know better than this. What was his dissertation about, how to not pay attention during class? I asked him about quartz and he said he prefers gallons. His headline for this section is, quote, evidence number six, many strata laid down in rapid succession, end quote. That's actually not the evidence, that's his claim about the evidence. His explanation is that these folds occurred as a result of many strata being quickly deposited, thus folding and deforming in these ways while still wet from the flood. Unfortunately for him, findings like these are well understood in the field of geology, and we simply don't need a global flood to explain them.
We're also told by Snelling that the lack of erosion between certain rock layers is somehow proof of a global flood. Quote, we find evidence of rapid erosion or even of no erosion between rock layers. Flat knife edge boundaries between rock layers indicate continuous deposition of one layer after another, with no time for erosion. For example, there is no evidence of any missing millions of years of erosion in the flat boundary between two well-known layers of Grand Canyon, the Coconino Sandstone and the Hermit Formation. Another impressive example of flat boundaries at Grand Canyon is the Redwall Limestone and the Strata Beneath It, end quote. Now this I really don't understand. How could creationists know just from eyeballing it that there wasn't any erosion? They don't accept the radiometric methods used to date these layers. So how are they coming up with this information about when one particular layer versus another was laid down, and how thick one layer originally was versus how thick it is now? And even if they're correct about this, that there were long time spans of continuous deposition, with no erosion in between? Okay, so what? What about that is impossible within a naturalistic framework? Maybe this was just a time period and location where a lot of continuous deposition was going on, to the point that it outweighed whatever erosive forces were at play. None of this strikes me as remotely mysterious or difficult to explain within a naturalistic framework, and again, it's simply not evidence of a worldwide flood. As if it's not already clear enough that creationists will seize upon literally anything and try to use it as proof of the flood, Henry Morris takes this to the max in his article titled Geology and the Flood, quote, an obvious indication of global water activity is the very existence of sedimentary rocks all over the world, which by definition were formed by the erosion, transportation, and deposition of sediments by moving water with the sediments gradually converted into stone after they had been deposited. End quotes. Sedimentary rocks exist, therefore it appears that the biblical flood actually happens. This argument is like half a step away from saying there are rocks, therefore God. Look, he's not wrong about the fact that there's global water activity. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in oceans, and basically all of the land surface on the planet interacts with water in one way or the other, whether through the presence of lakes, ice, snow, rainstorms, river flooding, and so forth. It should really go without saying that global water activity is not synonymous with divine biblical flood that required a 600-year-old man to build a large boat. Georgia Perdom defends the creationist viewpoint in a riveting lecture titled Noah's Ark and the Flood, Science Confirms the Bible. There she argues at one point that contrary to the conventional viewpoint that rock layers are only slowly laid down, and that large-scale erosion can only take place over millions of years, the Mount St. Helens eruption is actually proof that these things can happen very quickly. Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons, canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon, only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock in just days of cutting time. What this showed us, a lot can happen, right, if you have the right catastrophic conditions, which we did at Mount St. Helens. They talked about these rock layers there. You can see the person at the bottom for an idea of scale. This is a lot of rock, right? And it was laid down in just a few hours. It didn't take millions of years. It just took the right conditions. They talked a little bit about this canyon called Engineer's Canyon. This was carved out in nine hours. <laughs> That's all it took. Right? It just took the right conditions. So it's great observable evidence that it does not take millions of years for these types of structures to form. Now, one obvious drawback to this argument is that volcanic eruptions aren't exactly the same thing as large floods. But okay, you could make the same point about flash floods. These two can quickly deposit large amounts of sediment and also cause impressive amounts of erosion. All you're really saying here is, well, maybe it's technically possible that a global flood produced a large amount of the rock layers on our planet, and also carved out many of its erosive formations as well.
Saying that something is technically possible is not the same as producing evidence for your possession. And again, it totally overlooks the fact that we can date these different formations as being laid down hundreds of millions of years ago. Creationists, of course, discount radiometric dating, so that particular line of arguments might not have a whole lot of force with them. But the thing is, there are other lines of geological evidence that conclusively disprove the flood hypothesis, even lines of evidence collected by young Earth creationists. Phil Center presents a large compilation of such evidence in a paper titled The Defeat of Flood Geology by Flood Geology. There he points out that, quote, several flood geologists have presented geologically sound reasons why strata assigned to specific parts of the geologic column cannot have been deposited during the flood year, or at least during the part of it when the entire planet was underwater. In fact, compilation of such studies shows that together, flood geologists have eliminated the entire geologic column as having any record of a period of worldwide submergence, end quote. Keep in mind that the references in the quotes I provide from this paper are creationist publications, where the authors are people who believe that the Noah's Ark flood actually took place. So it's not like these are uniformitarian scientists who you can write off as being polluted by Darwinist teachings or whatever. These are simply other young earth creationists who, in trying to determine which rock layers were laid down by the flood, accidentally ruled out the entirety of the geological column. One line of evidence is charcoal to Deposits. Quote, Williams and Howe, Williams and others, and Holroyd described large amounts of fusane, fossil charcoal, from upper Cretaceous deposits in western North America. Williams and Howe also noted the presence of fusane in the Triassic Chinle Formation. All these authors further noted that charcoal is created by fire, which cannot occur underwater. Holroyd noted that fusane is also known from the Pennsylvanian Lake Carboniferous of Kentucky. End quote. And here we see in figure one from his paper that in these creationist publications, charcoal has been noted in Carboniferous, Triassic, and Cretaceous rock layers. Andrew Snelling confidently argues that flood deposits begin at the Tapiat sandstone layer of the Grand Canyon, which corresponds to the rock layers of the Cambrian period. But how could these rock layers have been formed during the Great Flood if smack dab in the middle of them, large amounts of charcoal are found? How if all land on Earth was fully submerged in water during this time? Could there simultaneously have been enough raging fires to produce such abundant amounts of charcoal? Another line of evidence are trackways produced by terrestrial animals. Quote, Northrop, Garton, and Robinson argued that trackway evidence eliminates the entire Mesozoic and Cenozoic portions of the geologic column as having periods of worldwide submergent strata. They noted that tracks of terrestrial reptiles and mammals are absent in pre-Permian strata, whereas they are present in Permian strata and are stratigraphy and geographically widespread through Mesozoic and Cenozoic strata. Sheevan also noted the presence of vertebrate tracks in the Permian. Such tracks are produced by live, air-breathing, terrestrial animals, and cannot therefore be produced during a period of worldwide submergence." End quote. And here we see in figure one that from the Permian on upwards, terrestrial tracks are found in every single rock layer, meaning that unless these animals were doing some deep sea scuba diving, the planet simply wasn't submerged in water at this time. Another line of evidence are rocks that were clearly formed on land during this time and not underwater. Quote, Basalt, a type of volcanic rock, can be deposited sub-aerially on exposed grounds or underwater. Unlike basalts that are deposited underwater, continental basalts, basalts that are deposited sub-aerially, exhibit laterally widespread flow, columnar jointing, and a lack of pillow structures, end quotes. And here we see that creationist publications note the presence of continental basalts from the Proterozoic onwards, meaning that this alone almost eliminates the entirety of the geologic column as having been laid down during a global flood. One final line of evidence we'll look at from this paper are raindrop impressions. Quote, Several flood geologists have noted that desiccation, drying out cracks, indicate extreme shallowness or exposure to air, and have cited their presence in certain strata as evidence that those strata were not deposited during a period of worldwide submergence. Ord, an advocate of the hypothesis that most of the Phanerozoic column represents the flood year, has expressed doubt that the identification of desiccation cracks in the geologic record is correct, noting that similar features can occur underwater. However, other flood geologists have noted that many of the deposits identified above as having desiccation cracks also exhibit impressions of raindrops, which can be made only on exposed surfaces." End quotes. And again, looking at his timeline, we see that such evidence spans a large period of the geological record. 
Wilfred Elders points out additional details about the Earth's rock layers that simply wouldn't make sense according to the flood model, and that's the lack of a sensible distribution in certain spots. Quote, Conglomerate is a type of rock that looks kind of like a natural concrete. It has a mix of sandstone or other fine-grained rock, but embedded in this are many rounded pebbles of various sizes, and even boulders. Many large deposits of conglomerate lie on top of great thicknesses, often several miles, of fine-grained sedimentary rock. The the great conglomerate sea cliffs near Marseilles, for instance, are hundreds of feet high and contain boulders more than a foot in diameter. What purely natural processes would enable the flood to deposit a thickness of several miles of fine-grained sediments first and then place the boulder-laden conglomerates on top?" End quote. Obviously, if these layers were deposited during the flood, as creationists argue, then the largest and heaviest and least buoyant of rocks would sink to the bottom first, whereas the very lightest of particles would settle out last. Finding the reverse of this turns this basic physical process completely on its head, but it makes complete sense according to the long-term geological timescale, where different layers can be deposited during different time periods, rather than all of this happening in one major event. Donald Wise, in a paper of his, brings up another geological process that simply couldn't take place on the short timescale of a biblical flood, quote, Thick salt beds formed by evaporation of seawater are a common feature of geologic columns in many parts of the world. The young earth geologists interpret almost all classic stratigraphic units as deposits produced during the flood year. Hence, they must also account for interbedded salt formations as part of those events. Some of the more extensive salt formations within the U.S. are in the Jurassic of the Gulf Coast, the Silurian of the New York to Chicago region, and the Permian of the Paradox Basin of Utah. In the center of the Paradox Basin, the salts reach a depositional thickness of 1.5 kilometers, with at least 29 separate cycles of salt deposition. To deposit just these beds in a single year would require the salt to form at an average rate of 4 meters per day, and this by evaporation during a worldwide flood event, end quote. In a desperate attempt to explain away this and other lines of evidence, many creationists will argue that absolutely absurd processes were taking place at the time of the flood, which allowed such evidence to materialize. As Phil Center writes, quote, such researchers explain the existence of multiple track-bearing strata between multiple water-deposited strata by hypothesizing that tectonic activity raised and lowered the land and or sea level in various areas several times during the first 40 days of the flood. According According to this hypothesis, during the first 40 days of the flood, a given area of land might experience several cycles of exposure and track making, followed by submergence and deposition of waterborne sediments." End quote. This is textbook special pleading right here, where because the evidence doesn't match up with their conclusion, creationists try to imagine all kinds of ridiculous circumstances that potentially could salvage their hypothesis. Circumstances they otherwise wouldn't dream of coming up with if not for the fact that the evidence doesn't match up up with their conclusion. Just to explain these salt deposits, for example, where there's clear evidence of dozens of cycles of salt deposition, you'd have to imagine dozens of cycles of continental uplift and lowering taking place. Dozens of separate cycles where salt water floods a certain area and then completely evaporates from that area, and all of this happening within a 40-day period before the earth is fully flooded. Such obvious grasping at straws makes it clear that creationists work backwards from their conclusion. Their starting point point is to accept what the Bible says is true, and then they put themselves through the most painful contortions to match the observations with their preconceived conclusions. By contrast, the way it works in science is to collect evidence first, and then follow it to the most reasonable explanation.